Why don't we just start with a little closed eye process? What do you think, Rachel? I think it sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Let's do centering insight style. Yeah. Let's do, let's just all close our eyes if you're comfortable doing that. And take a deep, deep breath. For some of you, it's it's almost sleepy time. Some of you are waking up to the beginning of this beautiful day. Some of you have been in your day for a while, and this is a chance to just take a breath. Take a breath in and breathe in the loving, the loving that is always present when we make that choice. In Insight, we talk about choice. We talk about its availability in every moment. So here's another moment to take a choice and to choose in loving as you breathe it in. From the top of your head to the bottom of your toes, and just feel a pure white light descending into your heart. Not just the heart that we identify in our chest, but that heart that is our, our soul, our body, our knowing. Let go of anything that's no longer serving you right now that could be keeping you from being present with us for the next hour of loving. and just breathe out anything that isn't serving as we connect our hearts to each other and into the world. We offer our gratitude and we say, so be. And when you're ready, just come present, open your eyes. I'm just so happy to look at you, Rachel. Rachel and I have been friends for, God, I think we're going on 30 years that we've known and loved each other. And uh, we're often known around Insight as like the the dark-haired sisters. (laughs) Changeable, irrechangeable. Of course, her husband might feel differently. Well, there's some days (laughs) like the rest of us. Yeah, you know, um, just just to step out of this conversation to give context, um, when this first idea of facilitator conversations was uh, presented to me in my role at Insight, uh, I was having a conversation with Gaia, who's in charge of Insight UK, and she was going, oh, I love that idea but you have to do a conversation on relationships because it's such a hot topic. And so of course I thought about it and I thought now who would be two great people to talk about relationships? Heidi's laughing because whether we're in front of the room, behind the scenes, on the phone with each other, we talk a lot about relationships, don't we Heidi? Oh yes, we do, especially when we're in trouble. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. We've, we've talked each other through some really difficult times, which has only made us closer. I also love that we come at this from such a different place. I, I'm the, the serial monogamist who just, you know, it just seemed for many, many years, I've uh, got, have had many different relationships each of them being very full and very rewarding. And as I'd like to say, the karma ended and moved on, each with a great learning and lesson in them and some heartache, but mostly a lot of joy. And it's been my path not to be with somebody, you know, my 10 years has been my longest relationship. And they're all very deep and meaningful to me There's nothing casual about my relationships. They're just not long-term marriages. It's not something I have aspired to necessarily. And Rachel, on the other hand. (laughs) Then there was Rachel. (laughs) So I have been, I'm in my third marriage right now and we've been married for 15 years. And that's a story in and of itself, but I'm going to backtrack to a conversation I had with John Roger 
many years ago, who's a founder of Insight and also somebody that guides me spiritually. And at that time, it was very popular for people. Sorry, Rachel, you're in a, a reverb. I don't know if other people are hearing it. I'm but... hearing it too. Okay. Let's Is see. it corrected? Yes. Okay. At that time, I was dating somebody and wanting to be in a relationship with that person, but everybody was saying, because this was sort of what was being said in the organization with John Roger, two legs walk faster than four, which means if you're here to grow spiritually and clear your karma and get home to God, you're better off alone. And so I was confused. Is this, is a relationship really for me? So I had a conversation with John Roger and I said, I, I basically asked him that question and he had a great answer for me. He said, Rachel, get you home to God, I will. And if it takes having somebody else in the car with you, then let's do it that way. And it seems to me like I've always had someone else in the car with me that I'm processing and learning and growing with. And that's how I see relationship. I love that because even though we approach from a different point of view often, it does come down to that. It, it's, it's every time I want to leave a relationship, every time I'm ready to walk out the door, I always go, where's the learning here? Where is it? And, and what, what's going on inside of me? And what I found is I, I've been in a relationship now for a year that has been in many ways the easiest relationship I've ever been in, even though it's been the most stressful because of the pandemic and being put in situations that I normally, you, you just don't face. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that because I know there's a few questions that have come up around like, you know, the higher divorce rate during this pandemic and why people are pulling apart. And what I found is I, it's not that I'm choosing different partners than I normally do or that I've, I, I'm not even sure what it is, why it's been made easier, except I can look at myself and say, I'm willing to take more responsibility than I ever had in my entire life. I'm willing to, to say, you know what? I know this path when I blame my partner and I know the pain it brings me. And maybe, just maybe, because I know it's a lot more difficult perhaps during this period to meet a new partner that I've been much smarter than I've ever been about what I argue about and, and where I take a stand and, and that, that part of me that's so independent, but yet loves being in relationships, loves partnership, loves having somebody to turn to that I know is there. And I have those girlfriends and relationships that, I mean, I'm so blessed with friends and people who will always look out for me, but there's something about a partnership that's intimate one-on-one -on -one, that I find I grow in a different way. And I know you've had that experience, Rachel, because we've talked about it how many times you're just like, Ugh! and yet you go, where's the growth? Where's the growth? And that's what I love about our relationship, by the way. We don't let each other get away with, with stuff. You know, we'll be there for the initial, oh, that sucks, he did what? But then we'll flip it pretty quickly to, you know, back to insight. What do you want? What do you really want here? What are you making more important than the loving? Well, you know, we'll ask each other those key questions mm -hmm. seem to always bring us back to ourselves and more available to the loving. And then it seems like a lot of the, the fights just dissolve. Yeah, I, I so relate to the desire to blame my partner for my disturbance. I, you know, in one of the Insight seminars, Insight 3, we teach a, a tool or a technique of communicating with more ownership. And I found that of all the tools that I've 
taught or participated with in all the insight seminars, that was the most challenging one for me. And I think the reason is on some level, when I'm upset with somebody, I want to blame them. And I find it really challenging, as you said, Heidi, to take responsibility. It's my upset. It's my upset. So uh, that continues to be one of my great teachers. And yet, the more I'm willing to love beyond that, and sometimes it takes every fiber of my beingness to reach out and touch Justin and go, I love you when I'm just some part of me wants to go. And I wouldn't be upset if it wasn't for you. It's like, it, it, it's amazing how quickly it brings us together when I'm willing to sacrifice that. Yeah, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. Yeah, I mean, in my work, I, we never talked about when we started what our work is, but I, I actually do relationship work with people. So I'm like, all day long, I'm dealing with issues and people coming and saying, how, you know, how do I improve this? Or now it, the big one actually is, is how do I meet somebody in a pandemic when all they're seeing are my little eyes because the mask is on my entire face and I'm not having the interactions I'm usually having. And um, it, how do I put this? We talk about this, Rachel. It's, it's like, where's your limitation becomes the issue. Like where are you not seeing possibility where there is possibility and for me when i look at people who are not in relationship now who want to be in relationship it's so easy to use the story of pandemic mm -hmm. it's so easy and or i'm just not comfortable on the internet it's not my thing i don't want to do that kind of dating and it's like in a way it's easier now to find somebody than in, in like an, a regular situation where we're out and about and we're at bars and parties because there's, a, there's a, almost a lack of intimacy in that. But when you're on the internet and you're meeting somebody and you're explaining who you are and, and you're showing who you are through going to the next step, which is after you meet somebody on a, on a dating app, actually having a conversation, going to video, sharing a meal in your house and their house, having that interaction, there's more intimacy. So what it comes down to is what are your belief systems about how this is working and what's possible? And what I love is you really, you know, went into your marriage with what's possible. You, your list, which to me is just like my, my Bible, for so many of my clients is so clear on what you wanted. You knew what you wanted. You knew what you needed to make it really work. And I wonder if you'd like just share a little about that with, with the people who don't know that. Sure. So um, I had been out of my marriage with the father of my three children for about two years and was carrying a lot of hurt, a lot of uh, caution around my heart, shall we say. And I had an opportunity again to have a communication with JR about this. And I said, you know, I'm ready for a relationship. And he looked at me and he said, are you ready to deeply receive? Because you haven't been. And I looked inside and I said, yes. And honestly, for the next 12 hours, I kind of felt like I had to throw up. It was really interesting how deep that went. Wow, am I really ready to receive? So we continued with the conversation and he said, well, what do you want? And my answer was, well, you know, somebody that's for my highest good. And he's like, no you need to be really specific. What do you want? So fast forward to a few weeks later when I was preparing my ideal scene for relationship, I think I came up with 54 different items. 
And I will tell you, they all were really in the area of what I wanted to be experiencing. I very consciously did not put in, he's six foot this, he has this color hair, this is what's in his bank account. It was more about, I experience being loved and cherished. I feel valued. I love how we laugh together. It was really an, a lot about the experience, which again is something that I learned in insight. It's like, what do you want? What experience are you looking for? I really went for that. Very shortly after that, I got a phone call from my now husband, Justin going, God, I really love you. Would you like to go hang out? And I went, sure, I'd love to. And then I hung up the phone and I went, oh my God, I wonder if he meant dating. And the reason I was surprised is he's substantially younger than I am. And my thoughts went to the movie, The Graduate and Mrs. Robinson. I'm like, oh my God, is this a Mrs. Robinson situation? But I went, you know what, why not? And so we got involved very quickly after that. And I would say six months later, I went back to my list of items and every single item I could say was, was ticked off with that relationship, including he's a perfect age for me. I didn't put a specific age, but I did put he's a perfect age for me. So apparently God had that planned for me. And what I had to sacrifice is what it looked like to other people. Because I realized that my happiness was more important than if somebody else was uncomfortable with the fact that there was such an age difference. You know, I love also that it's such a clear demonstration of intention versus method. Yeah. You know, that it wasn't, I'm going to meet him this way, or I'm going to do this, especially during pandemic times. I hate to keep going back, but that's where we are. And yeah. if you get stuck on method at this time, you could be sitting alone for a really long time. Whereas if your intention, I'm such a believer. When I learned about intention and in insight one, I mean, I was 23 years old. And I remember like going, wait a minute, wait a minute, like stopping the facilitator and saying, wait a minute, you're telling me how I get from my house to Paris. And at that time I was living in New York City. You're telling me I don't have to worry about that. Like that's not what's important here, but it's just that my intention of being in Paris next April, you know, uh, visiting the Louvre is, go is what's important to have the experience of knowing another culture, that's important. And how I'm gonna get the money together isn't. And they, and I, it, it was like, it, I couldn't like for a day, that just stuck with me an entire day. And then like go ahead, maybe, oh, I don't know, 10 years. And I, and I can recall like looking at my life going, oh my. Everything I've created has been based on my intention. The, and the method just keeps, keeps showing itself. Even my current relationship, one of the funny things about it is um, I went online dating. It was before the pandemic had started. And I picked, the second person I picked um, was this gentleman. And we started talking on the phone the next day which by the way, is one of my requirements. If you're gonna go online and date, don't, don't stay in chat, chat boxes. Get as quickly as you can into a conversation and then a visual conversation. And with, we talked for about a half hour and realized that we had met almost 10 years earlier and we just did not recognize that each other's picture. And we were attracted to each other then, but our situation and circumstances were very different at that, at that time that we couldn't come together. So like the, by the first date, it was like, oh my God, I know this person. I, I know this person. I never would have had that as a method. It would never even have occurred to me to go back in my past and look for somebody I was once attracted to 10, 15, 20 years earlier. So, 
I, I, you know, I'm such a, um, a proponent of redoing Insight One as many times as possible. I know I, besides being in front of the room, I've done the training myself at least 10 times. And I know looking over some of the faces that many people on this chat have done that. And if it's just for intention versus method and how that works in relationship, you know, and what's the experience you're looking for, whew, it's like worth all the money in the world. Yeah. Love that, Heidi. So the other thing I wanted to bring up because I didn't mention this in relationship to creating an ideal scene and having it come forward. But one of the points on my ideal scene was that my husband love and adore my body. And what I discovered was I have a man that loves and adores my body and often I'm not loving and adoring it myself. And I'm therefore not open to being loved. So my work was kind of, I was, what my homework has been is to discover all the places that need healing so that I'm deeply open to being loved, which is really what we all want, isn't it? So one of the things that I would say to anybody going into a relationship is you better look at what, how you are with yourself if you're asking for somebody to be a certain way with you and do what you need to do to come to that unconditional loving with yourself. Yeah. You know, Rachel, I, maybe I'm talking out of school, but I, I, I love when at one point you turned to your beloved and said, well, you love me when I'm old and, and, and I, I forget the exact words. And he said, I already love you. I already love you exactly as you are. Yeah. That is to me, like, if we, if we could see with the way people love us already, we would never doubt ourselves. I've declared 2021 the year that I doubt the doubter. That's it. <laughs> I've just said, I'm gonna doubt the doubter. Like, why do I give the doubter so much energy? Let me start doubting the doubter. And I know for me, I try to hide my vulnerability often. Like, it's just, I've had enough wounds. I've had, an, you know, we all have our stories about why that is. And what I find is I can't do that any longer in relationship. It's like, I think I'm doing a good job of doing it. And then I, I kind of look and I go, wow, he sees me. He really sees me for who I am. So why am I not making that okay? Why do I think those parts of me are not okay? And I realize I may never get to that place where I'm 100% in acceptance, but so what? Why would, that, why would I use that as an excuse not to just go forward and open my heart and be loving? And I find the more I work with people, the more that that's the conversation that the pandemic has brought up. It's like, this is it. This is where we are right now. So I might as well just accept who I am, where I am. You know, for me, it's been like, I, I can't get to the hairdresser anymore. I'm, you know, I, I don't do that. I have some underlying conditions that I have to be careful. So I'm not, you know, I could sit here and show you my grays and show you my flaws and whatever. And he's seeing them. And I've got, and it's been like ticking a layer away for me that I've not been used to. And I got to say, it feels so good. <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's like I shock myself every day. The more I let go of that stuff and just say, you know, this is it. This is it. This is the best I could do. And it's, it's, and it's pretty good. It's That's pretty awesome. good. Stuff. Yeah. So, um, are open? there any, yeah, I was wondering, um, Gabriella, if there are any questions for us from the group, and if not, people can write in the chat. I'm just reading. During the pandemic, my challenge is to love myself by exercising consistently and eating well in reasonable portions, but 
this has been a challenge. Well, I can relate. <laughs> can anybody else out there relate? <laughs> I have put on five pounds and I have been trying to put weight on for 10 years. So I know I'm on the other side of the spectrum, but I have to say the five pounds, even though it's something that I know is better for my health has been so uncomfortable. Like I, I kind of go, oh, what if it feels different in my body, I'm starting and I'm starting to accept it as part of strength. But I understand like, yeah, we're, it's like, why does it bother you? How is it bothering you? That it, I think that's an important question to ask yourself because there's some standards you're holding for yourself about who you should be rather than who you truly are. And I think and, relationship will always tell you who you are. <laughs> no, and also just having that, I love that you said you, you know, I have a challenge and yet an intention to exercise consistently and eat well in reasonable portions. And what I know for myself is I have to renew my commitment on a regular basis, which often involves forgiving when I go off. Like last night, I was off and I was really uncomfortable going to sleep. I'm like, why did I grab that and this and that and this? And I just was like, well, I can either carry it into tomorrow because I'm sure I can add to that discomfort or I can forgive myself for whatever humanness I went into when I had to eat the piece of chocolate and the dried mango and the this and the that and just go, okay. I love that you said about carrying it into tomorrow, Rachel because I think there's such a, um, in relationship, I know for me, I can have a disagreement or whatever at the end of the day. That's my, my goal is always to say, okay, I'm letting it go. If I can't let it go with my partner before we go to sleep, I'll be like, okay, I want the dream state to help me resolve whatever this is going on inside of me that I can wake up renewed because it, it loving is, it's, we don't want to be loved. We want to be in loving. Loved is too finite. Loving is an exercise. Loving is a commit, a daily commitment. It's a moment by moment commitment. And I know for me, and I could, oof, I could do the righteous thing so easily. It's like, especially if I'm with somebody who maybe hasn't done the amount of work I've done. So I could like almost skate it by like putting it on them so easily. We talked about that for a minute. And, oh no, this is wrong. And this is why it's right. And I've got that kind of mind that can make a good lawyer. Let's put it that way. I have all the evidence about why you're wrong. And I, I whether it's the relationship with yourself and what you're eating and how you're you know dealing with the extra stress so many of us are finding ourselves under, or it's just dealing with the everyday of just what a relationship involves or lack of relationship. It's too easy. It's too easy to be hard on ourselves and our partners. And so, and yet it's so much easier when you just let it go. You let it go. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I did notice in the chat, there was a conversation around eating out of boredom and other ways that we're challenged. And, and I, I absolutely can relate. I also, since we're on the subject of eating, I'm going to just talk about some of what I notice in myself is often when there's a disturbance, the first thing I do is go, well, food will comfort me. So it's a comforter. And so I've really had an intention to find comfort in other ways within myself. And that's been part of my work. It's, and part of that is I'll have a moment, maybe when I'm doing my meditation or spiritual exercises, and I'll stop and I'll go, look, Rachel, you're not hungry. Wow, you are so filled with light. And I will stop and acknowledge myself for that sense of fullness and fulfillment 
because the other thing has been such a pattern for me for so many years. So that maybe is a suggestion is when you have moments of feeling fulfilled without food, take a moment and connect and go, good job. I love that. I love that. So I hear in that also gratitude. There's even a gratitude that you have the food to eat, that you're, you know, that it's there and that whether you're making a choice, I mean, come on, make, make whatever choice you need right now to, to make your life flow better, easier with, with more grace. It's like, these are not, I'm watching people in the judgments of what they're eating, they're a lack of exercise. There's, you know, over exercising. There's every the spectrum is so wide, and and it's like where where are you loving to yourself? Like I take a bath twice a day. I take a bath in the morning and I take a bath at night. And one ritual that I will never give up. I hope. I hope. I hope because when you say never, you never know. Is I love myself. It's like I get in that bath. I go. I love you. I love you arms. I love you legs. I love. It's like, it's the time I look at my body and I don't look in judgment because often I'll get up. The first thing I do is I get on that scale. Okay, am I, am I in my zone? I'll look in the mirror, you know, is there more gray? Is there, is my skin okay? What do I need to do differently? That bath, that bath sets the tone for me where I go, okay, now it's the loving time. It's the ritual. It, so, Gabriella, are there any other questions? Yes, this is one I feel like most of us can relate to in some aspect or another. And that's, I want a partner. I just turned 60 and my job has been terminated after 26 years in my career. I don't feel like I have much to offer right now in terms of the world and have fears I won't be seen or accepted without a conventional successful life. I know this is an old issue of low self-worth, but anything you can share is appreciated. Well, I mean, the first thing that I wanna say is thank you for your candor and your honesty and willingness to just share, hey, this is what's up for me. And, you know, for me, it comes down to maybe what I, I mean, when I, when I tune in, what, what, what I think could be very nourishing and nurturing is to talk to that part of you that's not 60, but maybe five or six or four, the little child that's you. And to start there with, you are so beautiful. I love you so much. There is nothing you could ever do that I would stop loving you. You know, and start at that, just the tender loving to the little child inside of you. And maybe put your hands over your lower stomach where we know our basic self is, but to just keep loving yourself. Yeah, I, I just want to add, um, first of all, I'm with Rachel, like, yeah, it's not easy losing your job and everything. And, th and for your honesty, beautiful, really beautiful. And you, the thing is, there's such a gift in what's going on too, as always. The gift I see in what you've just presented is there has been an identification that what made you valuable was being having a job. What made you valuable, how you perceived yourself was having these things and hitting some benchmark in life. When in truth, who you are, who you are in your heart is what makes you valuable. And when you meet somebody who will match that, because we don't, you know, David Rayner, one of our fellow facilitators who I love and adore, and many of you do, oh, coined the expression, you know, you don't get what you want, you get who you are. And the who you are is not your job, the way you look, you know, 
any of that stuff. The who you are is, is your heart and your ability to give and receive, your ability to acknowledge other people as you acknowledge yourself. And when you, when you work on that, it doesn't matter the other stuff. I mean, this may be your opportunity that you're gonna pull in a partner that says, I could care less, you know, that you were once the vice president of Schmoe International. And I wanna just take care of you. Or it may just be the partner that says, hey, I know of opportunities for you. But you close it down if you define it through that very narrow hole. If you just go, this is the hole I can receive in. So I just encourage you to really look at the gift in this and go, wait a minute, where's the opportunity here to experience greater loving for myself and others? Or I think this is a tricky thing because a lot of people have gotten a lot of things in life without really feeling worthy. They've just wanted it enough that they've done what they can to receive it. And then when they receive it, they're not very happy. And if you wait for worthiness, you often won't leave. And in insight, we always teach, you've got to put action behind your desires and, your, and, and what you're looking to experience. There has to be action. So if you're waiting for worthiness based on the world coming around and meeting you in some image, you're most likely going to lose because you're not going to get the experiences you're looking for. So I, I, I just really encourage you to start looking through, through the eyes of love. Gabriella, is there another question? Yes, and thank you for that sharing, both of you. That was really beautiful. Um, any advice for how to transition out of a relationship that is no longer serving me while trying to be respectful of my partner's current emotional state? He is currently caring for his dying sister, and I do not want to add to his heartache, but I am clear that I no longer want to be in relationship with him. Heidi, is that you or did you want me to start? Um, I'm happy to start. There's a predisposition in that, the way you're stating it, that, that he doesn't have as much to learn as you do, that, that he's not capable of taking care of himself. And I'm wondering if that was probably one of the dynamics that was even taking place in the relationship where you took on more of the role of the, the carer the carer as opposed to receiving and being in an equal partnership that way. Um, when we leave a relationship, often we believe that somehow we're gonna hurt the other person. And this is our society, uh, you know, every movie, every, you know, it, how, you know, every book is how to survive a broken heart as if hearts can really break other than really looking at it as like, okay, there's opportunity here that's gonna be created. And I think you've just gotta look at it that way, have the compassion and the loving, yes, but how compassionate it is for you to stay and create a false image of what you know won't be, be going on. Sort of like, okay, you survived this, you survived this and by now, it's, it's like, you're better off cutting the cord in loving and knowing that he is or she is capable of taking care of themselves. Yeah. So, you know, I wanna, that brings up something that I think is important in general with relationships. And it's something that I've really had to work with within myself. And that's when there's differences in a relationship how willing am I to support myself? Because if I give up what's true for me, there's no way ultimately that that relationship will survive in a healthy way. There just isn't. And a lot of my learnings in all my relationships have been, well, I, I think deep down there's a, a fear of abandonment. And it's like, so I'd rather compromise on what's true for me than go, well, what if he leaves me and I'm not 
you know, blah, 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 whatever it is. And I had an interesting thing happen last night because I think it was last night, maybe it was the night before, but um, often Justin and I love watching fun shows together. And we were watching a new show for us on Netflix. And I so clearly heard inwardly, Rachel, you're not going to sleep well if you keep watching this. Whereas Justin loves the spine tingling, psychotic killer type of thing before bed, it does not work for me. And, um, but some part of me was like, but I love our time together, you know, and I, we had another TV, but it meant he was going to go somewhere else. And I just had to be honest and go, I think I'd rather have a good night's sleep. I'll trust that our love will, will be able to survive a difference in TV shows. I know it sounds mundane, but every time I've made that compromise in the past, it really hasn't served me. And that's just a metaphor for all those other moments where uh, I don't really need to look at what is aligned for me because I'd rather just go along with so that we are together. And um, so even in the process of separating, it's still about what's going to serve you because you need to take care of yourself so you can help take care of others. That's always the first ground rule in all of the insight seminars. I love what you brought up, Rachel, you know, in the confessional booth. I, you know, I, I've been, you know, pretty much living with somebody who could watch news 24 seven, can just, you know, at the minute it's like the TV's on the news where I'm more like, you know, let's choose what we're going to watch. Let's, you know, be in that. And sometimes a few days will go by where I've allowed myself unconsciously to just be okay with the news being on all the time. And I, I recognize I start shutting down my loving. It's like, it just, and I go, where was I like yesterday or the day before? Why did I not realize that this was slowly, I was slowly giving up what in, in what I thought was compromise, but what was really not compromise. It was me just wanting to be loved. So I was saying yes, and it's unconscious and my point with this is there's so much of this comes from the unconscious. It's, it's just like my five-year-old going, mommy and daddy, you know, I'll go with you, you know, all day and sit, you know, sit nicely. So you'll take me to dinner tonight. You know, we'll, we'll get McDonald's, whatever it was when I was, it wasn't McDonald's, but whatever it was as a kid. And some of it, you don't even realize you're in it. I mean, that's the thing about relationship. You don't, it's like, and it's so easy at that point to blame your partner, to go, well, you should have known that I can't handle that. I've been saying I can't handle the news. I can't handle it. And what I've learned to do, especially during the pandemic, is take that ownership language. It's like I spoke to spoke about this before. It's like, wait a minute. I'm the one that didn't remove myself. I'm the one that didn't speak up. I'm the one. And I just keep going. And then I go, okay, so... What are you going to do about it? And it's never about talking to my partner. Oh, I forgive myself. I love myself. So you made this mistake. Come on back. Come on back. And then I'll go and say, hey, I really need a day alone right now. Or I really need a few hours. And what I find is when I take it, time, that time, I'm so renewed that was ever that disturbance seems to go away. And I, and I bring this up because I, the divorce rates are getting higher and higher. And I get that, I don't know who asked the question, I'm not seeing a name, but I get that you're saying it's over and I respect that. But for those of you on this call that are like not sure and you're in this place of, I don't know, should I stay in this relationship? Should I not be in this relationship? Take the ownership for, for as long as you can to see where that takes you. Because I've been in counselings with couples that are just so sure it's good, it was over. And when they both made a commitment for a six month commitment or, or even for some people, it was a week where they said, okay, I'm gonna take the ownership. The shift took place and the loving came back. 
And it, it's, it's for, not, for me, I'm still surprised at it. And it's probably because I've messed up so many times in this arena that I still have shock that it works when I go, oh my God, this was me. This is me. This is really me. It's not them. It's not them. Gabriella, is there any other questions? There are several more. And here's one that's very specific to the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, my partner and I have different risk tolerance and he feels controlled by me when I ask him not to see friends and family since they are maskless and indoors. This is becoming a big issue as we both live in the COVID epicenter, LA. How do we both get our needs met during this time while still being safe? I'm gonna start, Rach. I could start because um, I've yeah, been- Yeah, why don't you start? Because it's more yeah. work. I have this situation where at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, after the first three months, um, my, uh, my boyfriend has three, three, three daughters and one of them is a 16 year old and the others have children. So it was like, he had a lot of family here where I have very little family where I am. And um, I put my foot down. I said, look, you know, um, I, I can't do this. I don't know, maybe we're gonna break up. I mean, that, that was my initial position. And then things shifted. We came to some agreements. And then where I came to was, what would it look like to take care of myself? And the decision I made, because I had that level of concern, was um, if you're going to do that, then we'll stay apart for a week or so, and then you will get tested and come back. And that shifted. And what I found is, as long as I stayed present and I wasn't on position, things somehow started to work out. And we came to places where we had greater understanding. We also had an agreement that it was the person who had the most amount that they felt at risk. Like I'm a high risk individual for COVID. So it became what my comfort zone was as opposed to what his comfort zone is. Now I've seen other people who have had much, you know, where the partners say, we're never leaving the house, this is it. And this has really hit something inside of them where they're just, this is the decision they've come to and their partner has had to deal with that. And when that has happened, it's been a great opportunity for them to look at how they nurture themselves and not look at what the outcome was gonna be, but more, how are we gonna deal with this as a couple? So it didn't become COVID related necessarily. It was about how are we relating to everything? Because in a relationship, if it's COVID now, you get married, it's money. One partner likes to spend more money than the other, higher risk. One partner really likes the windows open and the other partner wants the heavier quilt on the bed and one partner's snoring. I mean, you can go issue by issue. And if that's where you're gonna put your focus, then that's going to be you trying to negotiate all of these areas. Whereas, and it gets funny. And by the way, the, the funnier you are, the easier all this is going to be, you know? But I get back to this is just how are you going to relate to this as an individual and as a couple? How do you respect each other? And you'll find ways to deal with it. You will, they will appear, you will negotiate. I have seen it time and time again. But it's like Rachel said, take care of yourself so you could take care of others. Anything to add, Rach? The only thing that I would add is having a kind of communication with your partner where you're really hearing each other and reflecting that back. So that, I mean, sometimes I think disagreements really are much better handled in my case, if I know I'm being heard, even if I if my partner's not agreeing with my position or where I am, if he really reflects to me that he's hearing me and he hears why it's important to me, that has a, a very healing effect on the direction we take together with the disagreement. 
And I can add to that, often when we get in that place, our, you know, we get into a position, we think our partner doesn't really want to give us what we want. And they do. I mean, when you, I hold the belief, this is, you know, because when, when we're not getting, or we think we're not being heard, often like a very young part of us goes to, you don't love me, you'll never love me the way I want to be loved. I mean, there's about five different phrases that are pretty common that we have. And, and in that place, especially with something where we consider it life and death, which is what we're, you know, for, for some of us, that's what we look at this flu as, it, it becomes like, you, you're not hearing me. This is my position. I'm not going to shift. I'm not, you know, you've got to come to it. Whereas when you could just, as Rachel said, just have a partner and say, look, I need you to just hear me. It may not even seem rational to you, but just hear me because I need to express myself. And then for you who's expressing themselves to hold that what your partner is really doing is sitting there going, how can I give to her? How can I give to, I want to give, I want to, I want to take care of this person. I want this person to be healthy and happy and feel free and loved because we, we don't, we think it's an enemy. I'm sure the translators are going nuts at how fast I'm talking. <laughs> we think it's our enemy. All of a sudden we make our partner our enemy, not the person who's really in life going, I want to love you in the best way I can. And right now I don't know how to do that. Okay, so we have time for one more question. All right. How do you work on your heart? I left domestic violence and recently lost my parents and this feels like such a big part of me. How do I let the trauma and grief go in order to be ready to love again? I think the word recent is important here. Um, I would give yourself time to heal. I would look at working on the relationship with myself and being there for myself before I even chose into partnership, because that's the first part of healing is finding a place where you can be with yourself in a loving place. You know, I'm sorry you're, you went through that. And if anybody is going through that, please get some help, get, get some professional help. And just know that it's as valuable to be in a relationship with self as it is to be in partnership. Because ultimately every partnership are two people in relationship with themselves then coming together. And if you're not in relationship, in loving with yourself, it's impossible to have a successful relationship. Beautiful. And the only thing I would add is you asked about working on the heart and my encouragement to you is let your heart speak to you about anything. Maybe it's a flower you see or a song you hear where your heart feels touched. You know, part of healing the heart is just connecting to the heart in a safe, safe way and starting, you know, let yourself feel your heart energy where it's really safe to feel your heart energy before you venture out into the field of relationships with others. Okay, so I see that we have about five minutes left and we really do want to share with you about some of the upcoming opportunities uh, to continue uh, this kind of work, and I know Heidi's mentioned many, many, many times about the Insight One, as I have, we want to tell you what's available at Insight. So Heidi, you want to talk about this one? Yeah, well, this is great. This is uh, next week, we'll be a, a conversation about abundance. And um, these are two really abundant people, and not just financially abundant but in, abundant in consciousness and their ability to um, share wisdom and loving. And they, they come from it from very unique and perhaps different perspectives. So I think you'll, you know, long time, long time inside one facilitator, David Rayner, who just 
you know, love. And Nick Siegel, who's just always made himself available to insight despite, you know, being a very successful CEO. Uh, so courage, we really encourage you to tune in next week. And let us know what else you want because next week is the end of these uh, five conversations and there's a willingness to, to do more of them when we hear from you. So, you know, one of our, our goals for the new year at Insight is to be much more interactive with our community. And we're gonna be looking at you to reach out to us and letting us know what it is you want, what you need and how we could serve you. Because this is your family. Okay. And we're pretty excited about our new offering, which is Insight Ignite. And I want to tell you a little bit about why we decided to develop this offering. We realize that for those of you who are new to Insight, five days or three days on Zoom or four days on Zoom for an Insight One can be a big commitment for somebody that's new to Insight. And we were looking at creating an opportunity for people to get a sense of what Insight's about without having to have that level of time committed. So we developed and we're, David Rayner and a group of us have been meeting uh, it's going to be a two part series and it's five hours on the first Saturday and no four hours on the first Saturday and five hours on the second. And it's going to be a really wonderful way to launch the new year. I can't encourage you enough to think about taking it with yourself, but also who do you know that you've always wanted to to introduce insight to because we are offering this for $50 as a holiday promotion. And that is such a great, reasonable price for what they're going to get. Um, so we really would encourage all of you to consider registering a friend, maybe give it to them as a Christmas gift, and also registering yourself. I just want to add one thing to that, Rach. And that's um, what we did today was very was obviously an intimate conversation between two friends. It's so in in this training, even though it's online, the seminar, there's it's the experience is what people will be having as opposed mm -hmm. to just sitting and listening. It's for those of you who've done Insight One, you know how experiential it is, how very little time the facilitators would actually talk to you or lecture to you. I mean, it's, it's minimal compared to the experiences and the, the different tools that get set up for you to participate in. And because it's the Insight One has been done online, we know it works. We know we can create those experiential moments, even you being alone in your home and that connection that you feel. So that's what excites me about this is that in those eight hours that this seminar is, or 10 hours, I'm not sure if it's eight or 10, it, you, the experiences will be coming through, the loving and the joy and the laughter, all of that will be present. So I just wanna make sure you understand that it is Insight One and it is all the things we're used to in a condensed version. Yeah, I mean, it's, I just wanna add, it's part of Insight One. It's a taste of it. You know, it's not going to replace Insight One, but for friends that you've been talking to them about Insight for over a period of time, it'll give them an experience of what Insight is. And then we have one more offering we want to tell you about, and this is for Insight One grads. For the longest time, people have been saying, can't you do Insight 2 online? So we've answered the call because that's been a request. And this is via Zoom, it's Insight 2. I'm not Insight 1, but can't you do Insight 2 online? It's Insight 2 and it's February 17th to the 21st. So 
register. It's going to be limited to, well, that's interesting. Yeah, it just appeared. What was that? Yeah. <laughs> that was weird. It's going to be uh, limited to 30 people. So it's more than half full already. And if you know somebody that's always wanted to take insight to and hasn't been a lot able to, this is a chance to do that. All right, so that I think that completes our time together. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Heidi, for being my buddy. Oh, love you, Rachel. Just love you. And, and thank you to the translators, Alicia and oh my God, I'm blanking on her name. Who's Petia. Doing, Petia, Petia. And thank you, Roger and Gabriella for your amazing assistance. And we wish you more love. We, you know, and it's like, I love love. I mean, I think it's clear. I, I just think there's, there's nothing tastier. <laughs> there's, no, there's no sugar that I like better than a good relationship. So, uh, hey, if you're sitting on the fence, come on, jump in. Water's nice. All right, love you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining everyone. And you want to unmute everybody to say goodbye? Is that what do we do? Merry Christmas. Uh, my beautiful people. Bye. It's Navidad. Bye bye. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hola Alicia. Rachel. Hola mi amor. Thank you. Thank you. Merry Thank Christmas. You. Besitos. Buenas so noches. Oh, yeah. Buenas Bye, tardes. Rachel. Buenos días. Donde estés. Chao. Thank you. Muchas gracias a todos. Chao. Hasta pronto. Chao Bye. amigos. So <laughs> Bless you. Chao chao. Derus. Derus Gracias. Baruch, gracias. Gracias. Buenas noches. Muchas gracias, Alicia. Muchas gracias. Muchas a gracias. Bye. 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 Bye.